Hi, happy Chinese New Year. Welcome back to my YouTube channel and welcome back to Wonder Snatch. Today, I have a very special guest for this very special Chinese New Year episode, Becca the Bus. Hi, how are you? Mm, happy New Year. Be Becca and I go back a long way and today we're going to get into Chinese New Year outfits while just chit-chatting. And if that's something you want to see, don't forget to give me a big thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and ring that bell for post notifications. All right, Becca? Yes. <laughs> mm. See you later. Oh. Happy New Year. Mm. Okay, see you in a bit. All right, we're back. And Becca, let's get started. Actually, Becca and I go back a very, very long way. I think we knew each other when we were in school. So how long have we known each other like? <laughs> a very, very long time. I mean... We've known each other since we were, I was 13. I don't know if you're like younger than me. Actually. 13? Are you younger I, than I, me? I am one year younger than you. You said, you said I, I was your, the same age as you, but I think I am one year younger. Like, we're the same year in school, but like, I don't know, maybe some people are advanced or whatever. Well, in school, I knew, we knew each other from the drama club, right? Yeah, I mean, otherwise known as like the gay club. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the time... I think I probably joined the drama club as a, like a default because every, all my classmates were in it. But you were quite a presence in the drama club. You used to do all our makeup. Do you remember that? I don't know. Does that make me quite a presence? I thought I was just quite a presence because I was very like annoying and loud and irritating. I remember painting everybody and I remember uh, in hindsight, so is that already a memory? In hindsight, everybody looked a little bit whorish, but that's all right, I guess. Uh, not that far from the truth if you went to the particular school that the two of us went to. Did you learn how to do makeup at a time? Did I learn how to do makeup at that time? Uh, no, that's the thing. I kind of made it up as I went along. Yeah, I mean, Aha, did you, did it, did you particularly... I think, I, I mean, I think it, it's important to remember that this is, uh, this is a, this is a pre-internet time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, I don't know if it was literally pre-internet, but it was pre-internet for us, right? Yeah, Are so... Are you painting yourself white? Yeah, look at... <laughs> I want to surprise you with my look. <laughs> Well, fuck you. Yeah, so at the time, our makeup, I, I, I remember, I distinctly remember one time, we were having, I think we were doing like Macbeth mm. or something, and I was, um, mm. I was Mac, I was Macduff, was it Macduff? No, no, I can't remember, but anyway. I want to say you were Macduff, you were either, you were not Banco. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I was one, one of the people who were always with Macbeth, and then I, I, I remember just always going backstage. And then you were in one of the classrooms putting on mm -hmm. makeup all the time and being very professional about it. As in, I, I moved my hands very quickly and tried to look uh, like, try to look really busy. Is that what you mean by professional? Because I just thought you were always very, you, you were, I mean, of course, you have a very commanding presence. So uh, you were very, um, no, no nonsense about the whole thing. That's, that, that's the kind of feeling I got from you at the time. And right now you still do, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose, but like, let's also be real. Um, you say no nonsense, and did we like sanitize? No. You know, I guess we seemed like we knew what we were doing, but like, let's be honest now. We would not have passed muster in a, in a time of COVID. Let's just say that much. <laughs> do you have a relationship with makeup at the time, or do you just do it out of necessity? I remember another thing that we were, did a lot together. I mean, I remember the girly show. Remember you got us all to your house to watch Madonna's The Girly Show. I think that was quite a formative gay experience for me. I mean, the girly show is uh, it should be a uh, it should be a formative gay experience for everybody. Really, it was it's pretty incredible, right? Like, um, no, I, I can't say that I was wearing makeup like outside of that context. I'm gonna like take my shirt off. Okay, um, I'll join you. <laughs> yeah, I can't say I can't say I was. Uh, it was sort of all really, oh, right. Down. Like this just went. This just took a different direction. I was like deeply interested in Madonna and fashion. Like every little like gay boy tends to, not every, but like many gay boys tend to be interested in, you know, those two particular things. Do you have any um, memories of that time? I remember reading in an interview that you had a very homophobic encounter with a teacher once. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, my memory of that time is interesting because since our time in school, like, there are friends that I still talk to, you being, you being one of them, but, you know, like, we're not like super close in that way either, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I, I have friends who speak about that time as being this time of like constant bullying and deep homophobia. And to be real, except for that one moment with that one teacher who, in her defense, she claims to not remember this ever happening. So 
maybe I have an active imagination or maybe she's a liar, whatever. I don't have a big memory of these things. For me, I was just like too self-absorbed, I suppose. That's what I like to say. Yeah, I, I think I think I think I agree. I think at the time I was, we were all pro pretty probably quite self-absorbed in our teens and twenties. I would say so. I mean, like, isn't that the, isn't that the nature of being like a teenager? Yeah. What are you what what are you going for today? Lately, I've been playing with like just different shapes on my eyes. Yeah, I noticed some very interesting brows um, you've been doing. Yeah, but it's inter it's interesting you say that because I also feel like it's uh so I'm doing one of those brows today, but. Um, I also feel like with a lot of my makeup looks, like, I think like people who do, who play with a lot of makeup, so like drag queens and, you know, I guess some women too, they sort of say, you know, y'all would sort of say things like, oh, it's a different brow or whatever it is. But I feel like for everybody else, it's sort of like, whatever. <laughs> I have been cognizant of the idea that I am in fact older. <laughs> things that used to work, maybe... 10 years ago when I started doing drag girl work so early more. Yeah, I know that's something that you have said. One of the reasons why you decided to go all in for drag is because you feel that getting too old uh, messes up the makeup application or something like that and you won't be able to do this when you're older. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's just generally true, right? Like, your eyes, your eyelids start to droop and as we all know from like our friends, there are things you can do to prevent your face from falling apart. Um, hmm. I am neither that affluent, <laughs> nor do I care that much, frankly. And yeah, there's a point at which, you know, you just have like less eyelid space, your skin gets super crepey. I, I mean, I, I think I, I think there are a few things working for me in that regard, like I'm a fat person. Do you remember whether at the time when we were in school that um, we'd both be end ending up doing drag? I mean, are we, are we deliberately like not naming the school? No, 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 we can name it. I've named it before. We were at, we, we were at the gayest, okay, cool. gayest school. We were at the gayest school of all time ACS, <laughs> not hiding anything there. I'm not sure it's the gayest, <laughs> but it was hella gay. I mean, uh, you know, everything from like the student population to, um, I'm not sure if you call him gay, but certainly some kind of queer, uh, our principal at the time. But did, did, you, did you think that we both end up in this state? We're both doing drag together. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, I feel like I, I I, I knew that I wanted to be doing something in the space of like performance and creativity and that sort of thing. I don't know that I imagined a, a, a history of, sorry, a future in which like I would know, I would still be like in this kind of contact with people. I, I, that sounds funny to say, but like in a way, the two of us were in a, in, a, in a similar social circle and yet at the same time, the two of us were not really in a similar circle, social circle, right? Like yeah. we were in the drama club together, but then on the other hand, like you were... You, you were in the gifted education program, which is like, like I don't think you see people differently when they when when that's the case. But it, but you do also like, it's almost like you guys were in a different school sometimes. I I I, th I think that's quite fair. I think for the gifted education program, it was kind of an experiment at the time, right? I mean, they really tried. I'm I'm not sure whether do they still have it. I'm not. I'm I, I don't even know. I have to imagine that they do. I I cannot imagine that you know Singapore would would abandon a program that, um, that enforces an elitism <laughs> that seems very antithetical to the country. So you started drag in Boston, right? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, and, 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 you, and I know you used to do a lot of um, what, what they call what, guerrilla activist theatre there. Well, that was my first job out of college. I worked in a company called The Theatre Offensive, which was Still is, uh, it still exists. The Theatre Offensive is a queer theatre company mm -hmm. that had its roots in um, activist street theatre. Uh, my first job with them was to co-direct a program called A Street Theatre Named Desire, which is a guerrilla street theatre program that d did work in cruising areas, um, i.e. parks where men have sex with men in the middle of the night. Actually, all day, but we, we did our stuff. We did our performance work in the middle of the night. Um, and I still say for like all the kinds of like artistic and whatever endeavors since that is still like my favorite work ever. Mm. I mean, if you, if you ever, I mean, I feel like sometimes when we talk about like art and performance and, and that sort of thing, we do this thing where we, we actually have to, we actually wonder like what is the impact of what we do? 
you know, like, are we just talking to a bunch of people? Like, are we, are you just performing for a bunch of people who, you know, just like watch all kinds of theater or watch all kinds of performance? And there's a kind of like intellectual masturbation to the entire project in, in, in a way. And in this instance, um, there was actual masturbation, not on stage, not in the performance, but like, you know, uh, you're performing, you are, you are making work about, you know, that's like sort of talking about a HIV transmission or, or STIs or, um, or, or just the life of being a queer person, but you you are you are talking for, in in a very clear way. You are talking about sex, like literally ten feet from people having sex. Um, you're talking about HIV transmission, literally like feet, you know, a few short meters from what might actually be actual HIV transmission. Um, so if you want to talk about whether or not this work has direct impact, it's like it's so clearly obvious that that it you know. That direct impact actually happens, and uh, that's exciting, you know. And I've never, I've not done anything since that has had that was so clear. Yeah. Did you ever think about bringing that kind of stuff to Singapore? Or do you think the audience here won't um, is are not receptive to that kind of art? Um, I don't think it's about the audience that's not receptive. It's about a context, right? Like what are a similar kind of cruising area in Singapore where you can have that kind of that kind of space where people are not constantly afraid of being arrested for instance um, you know the the context is different right like mm -hmm. like gay sex in Singapore is actually illegal that changes a lot of things right but um, how about the whole thing about HIV awareness? Do you, I mean I know you you are part of the queen size cheekies and everything but do, do you do that outside of that as well? Outside of queen size kiki? Yeah no, because actually, I've never been, I haven't, re before that, I hadn't really been approached to do that work in Singapore. There are ways in which, like, I'm interested in those conversations, but, you know, one of the sort of really deep things that we learn from doing a street theory named Desire is that, actually, awareness is not the issue, <laughs> in a sense. Like, people are well aware of what HIV is, and mm -hmm. people are well aware of what, they're ri of what, of the risks that they're taking, and, and all the rest of that. You know, it, it's a little bit more complex and nuanced than... That. It's the behavior, it's right? It's the actual behavior that needs to you need to be able to address. I mean, it's behavior. It's also like there's a way in which we talk about issues, like, it, like issues like risk. Like it's so black and white. Like you know, this is risky, therefore you don't do it. But actually, anybody who's ever a had sex or b thought about risk in any other context would know that actually risk is like it's it, it's something that happens on a scale, right? Like you make decisions about whether something is worth the risk you don't actually go like, oh, it's risky, therefore I won't do it. If, if that were the case, the stock market would not exist. You, you know, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, of course. You know, that's the conversation that perhaps doesn't happen so much, is where we sort of acknowledge. What I would always say is this, it's like the, the least risky way you can have sex is to imagine it. It's not very fun though. Just as somebody could uh, imagine climbing a rock wall, it's not very fun. And at the same time, we don't we don't turn around and say, "Hey, you person who uh, climbed Mount Everest without an oxygen tank," we don't turn around and say, "Like you shouldn't do that." Instead, as a society, we perhaps even like throw a party when that happens. And where is my fucking party for having like unprotected sex? Y you know yeah. what I mean? If we can, if, if we can recognize that there is an achievement in uh, taking some risk. Why does that not apply to sex? What What do we fundamentally believe about pleasure and sex for us to say about? I think I think people are having these kind of conversations now around COVID, right? I mean, people want to go out, people want to do this, and and they are saying that it is a risk assessment, your own risk assessment of um things that you do. But at the same time, you have to also take into account the risk to others as well. So I think um yeah, I agree that this is the kind of conversation that maybe with after COVID, people will be more willing to to have. Like as gay people, obviously there's the there is the example of like gays gays after COVID, right? Gays, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Um, gays over COVID, and like uh, maybe isn't as applicable in Singapore, but from what I hear, not precisely not applicable in Singapore either. I think in that instance, it's a little bit different because we are in fact in a crisis where we are, you know, or maybe not so much in Singapore because I, you know it's we we seem to have things a little under a little bit better control. But certainly, what's happening, what is happening in the U.S you know, the conversation isn't just about your risk. It's, it, 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 you know, it, it is about, like, 
public resources and in, in, in essence, ensuring that those resources are available for the, to those who need them the most. Yeah. So on the one hand, you could get sick and that is your risk. But on the other hand, you could also make it so people can't access Exactly, yeah. I, 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 I totally or agree. Is that your risk healthcare. for other people and, you know, taking up a space in ICU, keeping the doctors so busy that they, you know, miss something else, you know. And it's not just the people with COVID, it's all the other people with other um, chronic illnesses as well that are suffering. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that there is a conversation, you know, like that, that conversation, I think is a little bit different than it is with like um, people making choices around their sexual health. The way we talk about COVID and the way we talk about risk, maybe that can spill over to HIV as well. Because it needs to take into account the relative risk for everything on a whole. And maybe after COVID, when people have started learning about this, maybe they will, I don't know, be more receptive to that. Perhaps. I mean, I should also say that like, how, how do I mean this? As, do you mean receptive as in receptive to the idea that perhaps like personal risk is a bit more complicated and yeah, yeah. nuanced? Yeah, that, 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 um, that behavior modification according to risk is um, something that people need to take into account for um, every um, public health issue. Yeah, but I also think that with public health, we can say that and I think that actually a lot of people who do the work believe that. But public health also has an element of like public health policy, which is not immune to the forces of uh, sex negativity and homophobia. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess. Right? And, and in Singapore, that's rampant. <laughs> uh, I <clears throat> no comment. <laughs> Genuinely no comment because in a way I don't I don't get involved in the work on a policy level and I all I'm dealing with is like a series of guidelines. At this point making content that meets those guidelines, right? Like in a way I'm I'm quite a I, I don't get to decide structurally what that content will be, for instance. Hmm. Okay. So you came back to Singapore in twenty ten, right? I arrived in Singapore on the twenty seventh of December twenty ten. So we might as well say 2011, like those four days barely count, right? Okay, yeah. And your work with the activist group kind of like ended because of the grant money or something like that? Yeah, I mean like my job just dried up and then I got laid off. Do you want to come back or do you were you trying actively to look for something else there? I mean, I was actively looking for something else, but like let's not forget, this was 2000 and this was 2010. Oh, yeah, this is right after the financial... And, and actually, I mean, we say right after and in reality, you know, the entire economy is still reeling from it, right? Like, um, We're in a similar situation now, right? I mean, Ashley 50 came back because of coronavirus and it seems like he's stuck here. I just saw a post that he's trying to move all his stuff back. It's similar in that uh, you're moving without a choice. Moving back to Singapore is maybe the best of available choices. But dissimilar in the sense that it's not... In, his, in her case, I don't think she's necessarily driven by a lack of work. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? I don't think it's about employment as much as it's like literally the reason that you would be allowed to be in the country has like evaporated. Yeah. Which was, which was my case. Yeah. So, so how, how did you um, adjust coming back to Singapore? Do you, do you think Singapore was, I mean, obviously more conservative and what we men mentioned earlier, more sex negative. Is, is that why you didn't st start immediately going back to drag? You were in the corporate world for a while, right? I mean, I worked a corporate job that made it impossible to, like, commit to weekends. You know, like, I was traveling for work a fair, a fair amount. I, I should be clear, it's not that, like, my job said, you can't do this. I think sometimes it sounds like that was a situation that was not a situation. But your question was about, like, adjusting to coming yeah, back. Yeah, adjusting to coming back. Adjusting to life back here. And, you know, I thought it was going to be a lot tougher than it really was. I'll say that much. I was really prepared for it to be, like, horrendous and terrible and... That was not the case. Maybe I was oblivious, also very possible, but I didn't really experience it as being so terrible. Sorry, I need to concentrate. I'm just drawing around my boob window. I feel you. I did my boobs before um, before we joined. I had some extra time. You mean because I logged on late? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I decided to draw the boobs on then. See? I mean, I could probably just do this. Mm. <laughs> But I also de just ne never bother with boobs. It's never been my thing. Like I'm probably one of the, like the least feminine of drag queens, right? Yeah, that's your style of drag, right? I mean, um, you're like straddling this area between um, femininity and I don't know what would you say. <laughs> the grotesque. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I get to say that like I'm playing with the grotesque because I don't really think it. 
Um, I don't think I push it that far. Uh -huh. I also feel a little bit like, look, I'm not going to kid anybody that, that like I'm feminine and a woman. So I'm interested in the in in the kind of creative potential of like constantly highlighting and constantly like failing at being feminine, if you will. When you when you mm -hmm. started doing drag in Singapore, was it almost immediately with Riot? When I moved back to Singapore, actually, like the first thing I did was to the first sort of like drag and performance related thing I did was to restart Doctor Sketchy in Singapore. Was was that Doctor Sketchy, which is like a life drawing class uh, in which the models are all performers or personalities. Usually it's burlesque, but there isn't really a huge burlesque oh. in Singapore. There certainly wasn't one when I was when I was doing that. I used to model for it in the Boston chapter, and so I kind of knew of it. They had the same thing in Singapore? Yeah, and uh, it was running before I came back, but the guy who was running it left the country, and for a while it was dormant, and so I kind of took it over. Oh, um, that was a good jumping off point. Was it very successful? I think in a lot of ways, it's challenging to do it in a place like Singapore because actually... Uh, if what you want if if what you want to do is to practice life drawing um, there are quite a few options in Singapore like people run people run life drawing classes or life drawing sessions uh, a fair bit and it's quite accessible um, and not not particularly expensive but it worked for a while and I was doing it for a few years and then I started this corporate job that I was that I was talking about you, you were actually doing drag before the corporate job. Yeah, but very briefly, and I wasn't actually like, I mean, I was just hosting it, right? So it was just, I was just trying to connect with, like, the performer community in Singapore, if you will. Okay. Because in a way, I also think that as much as, as much as I am a, you know, like, I am a drag performer, I'm a drag queen, and as much as I very, you know, very much think of drag performers and drag queens as, like, my people, I also think of my people as including, like, club performers in general, uh, go-go dancers and, uh, you know, so, so on and so forth. Like, to, to me, like, my, sen my sense of, like, what is, like, the scene includes all that, right? Um, and for me, like, drag is a specific subset of, of that bigger scene, if you will. So you're also one of the most, one of the more um, prolific drag queens in Singapore. You've, you've, you're almost all over the place. You've got the Glory Holes, you've got the Hoedown, you've got Lulu's Bar. I mean, you say that, and in reality, like, I don't have any of that right now. Yeah, right? I mean... Like, we are in a time of COVID. But, okay, before b before COVID, that, that, that was all very impressive. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, you, you, were, you were quite in demand, weren't you? You know, actually, I, I think a lot of that is a function of uh, being full-time. It's about having the time, the space, the, the bandwidth, and the availability to jump onto gigs and, and, and make them work. And I think a lot of that is, and the, so that's one part of being full-time that makes that happen. The other part of being full-time is you become aware that like, if you don't, if you don't um, quite aggressively seek out these opportunities, then you potentially don't eat. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's real in, in, in a different way, right? Because it's, it's literally your career. It's not like a thing that you do on the side. It's not a hobby. It's not something that you work a day job to fund. It's literally your life. So you don't have a choice about it. You just have to go out and do it. You know, like I, I found I found my thinking about this and my strategy around this to be quite different because my strategy around this was like, uh, was, was things like figuring out, you know, what my positioning in the scene is, which I don't think... I deeply suspect most drag queens who don't do it full time barely even think about, right? Like, I don't really... Because why would you? Like, for, for a lot of drag performers who aren't doing it full time and aren't making a living out of it, like, you kind of just... I don't want to say just because it's not... No, let me rephrase that. You kind of think primarily about what it is you want to put out there. And that is important. I think every, I think every performer and every artist thinks about what they want to put out there. But... Once it becomes a, once it becomes your livelihood, you also have to think about what you put out there in relation to everybody else and in relation to quote unquote the market and uh, so on and so forth. All right, do you see what I'm going for now? Uh, perhaps. I'm no, not I, it all makes sense in the end. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> isn't that like? I don't, I, I don't know about you, but that's that's certainly like my experience of every time I've gotten into drag. It all makes, it'll, hopefully it comes together. Oh, well. Yeah, in the end, it all comes together. Not always. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're talking about you coming back to Singapore. Did a lot of people in Singapore get your name? No. Or do you have to explain it all the time? Um, I don't really, because I think people get what they get out of it. So I think that the people who just don't think about drag names as having as having meaning and being punny or whatever 
and that's mm-hmm. okay. And there are people who uh, can see the word bus and recognize, you know, recognize it as like the mode of transportation, and then they just think it's a fat joke, and that's okay, as in like Becca, the size of a bus. Um, and then every now and then you'll get people who who get it, get it lah. And you know, far be it for me to tell you how to how to get it. You know what I mean? Do you have any other names in mind? I originally wanted to be Sybil Disobedience. <laughs> I don't see you as a Sybil. I mean, do you really see me as a Becca either? Let's be real. Yeah, now I do. I do definitely. It, I well, guess yeah, but grown into that, the name. But that's a function of like familiarity, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other than in public and everything, do you have, do you ever get any like you know negativity towards your drag? How do you mean? Um, either outright homophobia, or do you think people don't get what you do? Or I think that's going to be the case with anybody who's doing not doing anything different. That's not what I mean. But like, mm, anybody who is going to spend time creating drag, put themselves out there. Yeah, like you know. That's that's bound to happen. I think that I mean there are people who don't get like the performance stuff or don't get that like I'm not beautiful or not pretty or whatever or not feminine, and you know that's okay. I don't particularly think I'm feminine either. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, what what are the messages that you are trying to do with your drag? If it's um, is it more of a gender thing, a queer thing? What 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 what, what goes through your mind whenever you? You know, put yourself out there. To me, right, like, a lot of what I'm doing is just, like, I wonder what it would look like if blah, 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 blah. It's not that deep, you know what I mean? I do think that a lot of my f- performance stuff insists on a kind of, like, unfortunately still radical for, like, fat queer bodies to enjoy themselves in public or for somebody to enjoy their own fat queer body in public. I find that uh, that confrontation to be, like, quite... I guess the word's productive, like... I think we're getting into a kind of art speak that I don't love. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I actually I actually wrote down here confrontational body positivity and shock. <laughs> That's, that, that, that sums you up, do you think? <laughs> I just um, want to hear from you. Maybe it does. I don't know. Uh, confrontational body positivity and shock. I mean, I think th- th- those are all elements of what I'm doing. But also at the same time, I think what I'm doing, it, like I'm interested in notions of like what is beautiful and what, and like I, maybe what I'm doing is not conventionally pretty. Um, actually, yeah. not even maybe like I know that what I'm doing is not conventionally pretty. But I am actually interested in like in in beauty. I'm, I am interested in things that are like pleasing to the eye, and in, in you know. So like while while it is true that I tend to put together colors and shapes and and what have you that uh, don't usually belong together, I am actually interested in them being like uh, aesthetically beautiful or at least aesthetically resolved. Yeah, I think that I think that boils down to almost every drag queen, right? We like pretty things. We can rationalize it all we want, but in the end, it's a pretty, pretty and sparkly things that make us that get to us. <laughs> no, but that's but that's but that's actually that's exactly what I don't mean because I think that I, I, I think that there is something about about the potential for the grot- grotesque nature of drag for the kind of like confrontation of drag for the kind of um, uh, you know take, take me as I am kind of attitude about drag that for me it offers a way to open up a potential for what else can be beautiful of how else we can reach a place of beauty that isn't just necessarily about like oh pretty things or oh sparkly things because I think I mean, I'm certain. I'm certainly interested in pretty and sparkly things. Don't get me wrong, but I'm also much more interested in what else is beautiful. In in what else can, you know, like how do you push this? How how do you push, so that you can still create beauty without like necessarily relying on those things, or or how do you create beauty while also you know dabbling in things other than what is conventionally beautiful? If, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. At least in my co- in, at least with like my costuming and and performance stuff and the images that I'm creating, that's something that I'm thinking about a lot. How do we expand the potential of this idea? Yeah, I think I think for me too. What 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 draws me to drag is that I can like mash up all sorts of different ideas and put them on your body and put them you know in a way that challenges yeah challenges the idea of what a conventional 
pretty woman is supposed to be. Are we even inter are we even talking about women? You know. <laughs> Do you think approaching drag that way is a little bit too um, too much for Singapore? No. <laughs> um, what is too much? You know, in a, like why that, would that, you know we you, we're, we're challenging conventional ideas of beauty? Do you think that's a little bit too? I mean, I don't know. Do, do, do you think that it's too deep for the majority of the Singaporean audience? When, when you know, most Singaporeans, their, 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 their gateway to drag is things like Liang Po Po or Kuma or, you know, very crass and very theatre drag. Uh, I would not say that Kumar was crass. Like, I think it's actually... I think what he's putting out is actually quite nuanced and actually very complex. Um, it's... I think it's packaged in a way that allows you to perhaps ignore some of those complexities, but the complexities are there, and they're there if you if you mm. if you want to get into them. Okay, you know, and I, I think that's no, quite, that's fair enough. Yeah, I guess. I, I yeah, think I, for I, me, that's quite important. Being... But I also think then that I do think that there's a way into what I do if you don't want to sit around and think about these sorts of things. Yeah, if, if you don't really want to think about like the nature of like beauty or whatever, I think you can look at a lot of what I do and just be like, oh, it's very colorful. Or, oh, it's very, you know, I think that people say, people say things like, oh, it's, <laughs> you're very creative. <laughs> um, that's often code for like, I have no idea what the fuck you're doing, right? I, I think spectacle offers us the possibility of like, um, it offers us a way in. So if nothing else, I think you can, I, I think people can agree that what I'm doing is big, colorful and spectacular. And um, often spectacle is pleasure enough. So for me, that's an easy way. That's a, that's a way in for an audience. But then there's also all the other, you know, like once you're in, then you can sort of like stay for the complexity, if you will, you know, and, and some people are into that and some people are not. Um, just as I don't okay. pay every performance, well, for every, every performance for everything. There's something happening in your light. Just... Yeah. <laughs> Let me just change the batteries of this. You the fucking, light. like, yeah. fucking hell, you've, like, installed a strobe? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I quit. Uh, should I continue painting or no? No, no, no. Yes, yeah. Continue, Just please. carry on? Okay. Just let me know, yeah, because I'm very, like, free and easy, if you will. Yeah, so, um... I, I've, I've performed twice at Riot and, I, mm -hmm. and both times I've had a great time and the first time he asked me I was very very happy I was like wow he actually uh, I, I, I was uh, very um, honoured to be to perform and, and, and I did meet Ashley 50 at that one mm -hmm. How, uh, what, what kind of atmosphere do you try to foster with Riot when, you, when it comes to picking people you perform and stuff like that I mean for me Riot it's very clear that for me, Raya is about performers doing exactly what they want to do. So I try to have as little input in what people are doing as possible. For the most part, I have learned, and actually you were a part of me figuring that out, that we don't really do live singing at Riot because we just don't have the tech in place to do it well, if that makes sense. Like, for instance, when you performed at Riot, like, it was very. It was abundantly clear to me backstage that the tech was not supporting what you're doing, by far, and we were just not equipped to do it well. So I, I, I generally don't let people do that anymore. Um, but oh, beyond okay. that, aesthetically, I'm interested in people doing exactly what the fuck they want to do, and I try to not get involved. I, I, I didn't notice. I had a great time, and I think, <laughs> and I think I got a lot of feedback that day that they were quite surprised to have a live singing uh, queen. Yeah, because the thing is that this happens at every venue that we've done. At every venue that I performed in, and you've done, I think you've been in two of them. Like, in general, first of all, I need to know that you can sing to begin with. Everybody thinks they, they can sing, right? Like, as it's every, it's everybody knows, like, for instance, like, every Drag Race girl records an album. <laughs> like, it's, 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 like the, it's like the thing to do, and 90% and, and of them probably shouldn't. We all seem to think we can sing, and I and you know on a very fundamental level we all can sing. It's just whether or not everybody else should listen to it. My discovery after you performed at Tab, where you did sing, was that uh, was that oh okay we can't keep doing this because really the text not up. the the text is not up to scratch. The levels were never were never precisely right. Like you know etc cetera, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. All the things that you need to think about with these things. And then at uh, Hard Rock Cafe you sang, and it was again like I was sitting backstage being like. Oh wow. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like the tech is not there and you and we just know it and there are examples of good of what good tech looks like in lots of different places, right? And it's like this is not it, y'all. This is not the good tech. 
um, and we're not equipped to do it. So, so besides that, oh, that's a pity. I mean, it is a pity, but it's also like okay, lah. Just know your, just know the, just know the um, limitations of the space. Yeah, and like, and then like focus on what you can you can deliver on. You know what I mean? No, oh, okay. Uh, that, that oh, was focus on what I, we. I thought, as... I thought it was quite fun. <laughs> no, I think it. But that's the thing. Like, I think it was fun. I think it was fun for you. I think it was fun for people who know you. I think I'm. I'm not even certain that people in the audience necessarily like noticed. But as a show producer, um, you know these, these. You notice these things, right? Because you're interested in presenting people as best as you can present them. Like in on a certain level, will do is not is kind of not good enough. Generally, like you you want to be able to be proud of what you're putting out there, and you want to be able and you want to support performers in doing what they're doing, like on a pretty fundamental okay, level. Yeah, that's fair enough. But yeah, so Riot is um is interested in this eclecticism. It's interested in um ensuring that like we're presenting a kind of expansive and diverse vision of what drag is or is in Singapore rather. But it's, I've also realized that it's bizarrely a show with uh, where the stakes can be quite high for performers. So I've also realized that like- Stakes. The stakes, yeah. Because in a way, like of all the drag shows in Singapore, it's probably the most expensive. You mean for the audience? For the audience. Um, it's uh. the only thing that you go to to sit down and watch a show, right? Uh, and focus on nothing else. So like, yes, there's a dance party after, but like actually those two things are separate in, 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 for a lot of people. Like there are a lot of people who come to the show and just for the show. Then there are people who come early for the party to watch the show. And then there are people who only come for the party. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has to stand alone and, it, it, and, that, and that changes a lot of the dynamics around it, right? So I generally am very cautious about presenting people who are very new, which is unfortunate, but I just don't think, I, sometimes I just don't think the show does like very new performers um, any favors, you know? Do you have any tips on hosting uh, a, a drag show? Let's say. <laughs> I know you were backstage when I was trying to, uh, when I had my own show. Do you have any tips for me for hosting a drag show? For hosting a for show? For hosting a drag show? <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, this is an interesting time to say this because obviously like COVID, but hosting a drag show or hosting any show for that matter, at least for me, like, it's about connecting to connecting quite deeply with the energy that's in the room and the people that are in the room and then playing with that energy and manipulating that energy and um, so that that's part but that's part of it. I think the other part of it is or that I have found is that I think it's really critically important for especially in the context of something like Riot. Like I was saying, like I don't think necessarily the show does a lot of favors for very, very new or inexperienced performers. We also do present a a, a range of aesthetics. We present a range of what it, of what drag could look like, uh, be that in terms of like look, in terms of performance style, in terms of like gender presentation. So for me, uh, it's important that as a host, you are setting it up. And I mean, I would say the same as a show producer. Uh, you are setting it up so that the audience is best able to receive what performers are doing. You know, you don't want to show up empty-handed, so you don't want to show up to, to a show, like, without stuff to that you can lean on. But I also think that sometimes, I mean, what I've learned is that it's also critically important to be completely willing to just let go of all of that because the house is, because the house is going in a different direction, you know? Like, you're, you're mm. a host, you're not there to deliver a script. <laughs> you're there to connect with people, I think. I'm probably very too inexperienced, but I think when I hosted, there was just so many things going on in my mind because I was also worried about the costumes, I was worried about the, the drinks, about the food, about this and that, and it was just really a lot to take on. <laughs> yeah, but I also think that, like, that's, that, but that is the work to me, anyway. As, as a host, just, just as the name might suggest, like, you are also not just an MC, you are also, like, literally the host. So if, like, you, if you liken it to throwing a party at home, you are worrying about all these things, right? You are worried about, like, the food and the drink and the whatever. You know, in the context of Hard Rock Cafe, like, for instance, I am constantly thinking about, like, the level of service that people are getting. You know, I'm also hyper aware that, like, the show is so much better if people are drunk. So if people have access to alcohol, if people are having a problem getting access to alcohol, that means that the experience is not as hard as it could be. That also then mm, means that we're not true. setting up the context for in you know, quote unquote success of the performer. Is it I draw eyebrow then cannot talk? Yeah, it is. 
<laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been strategically trying to not talk when drawing around my mouth. I feel like this is the part of like a lot of these like drag makeup videos that people speed over, where they draw their eyebrows or draw their eyeliner. Yeah, they do it off screen usually. Do you get into a lot of um, issues with um, the IMDA or censorship with Riot? I know when, when I wanted to perform a song last time, we I was a bit scared because they asked for the lyrics and all that. For the most part with Riot, because we because of where it was performed, I, I say was like it's done, but you know, obviously these are different times. Typically I would work with venues that under licensing laws would be allowed to present, I don't remember the term for this, but mm -hmm. essentially without applying for arts licensing. So they just say that it's regular entertainment. They just say that it's part of regular entertainment at the venue. And that's how we slide into it, right? And this is getting kind of technical. So like that, this has always been an important part of how I negotiate with venues or the kinds of venues that I want to work with. Quite simply, it's the nature of drag that people don't actually think about what they're doing till pretty late in the game. You know? So like trying to get mm -hmm. a license for these things is like a fucking nightmare, excuse the language. How, how about for the glory holes? You know, you bring in all those movies. Is that I mean, is we that, clear, we is clear that the a films. whole other fish? We clear the films. Yeah. Uh, the glory holes doesn't generally screen like new films. So actually very often they're already cleared by the time we're interested in getting them. Yeah, and the element on top of it, which is like the hosting, like that doesn't really need to be cleared. Like you're just hosting a screening, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, th and that's something you do with my very good friend Bobby, right? From Super Freak Boutique. Check out Super Freak Boutique. <laughs> that is correct. That is something I do with Bobby. And I enjoy doing it with Bobby a lot. Okay, look, I'm doing a tea pal body paint. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> also a Ming vase, huh? apparently. Yeah, Ming vase. Chinese New Year Ming vase. Is that a thing? Yeah, I mean, whenever you go to a Chinese uh, 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 house, there's always a Ming vase with all the pussy willows coming out of it, right? That's right. <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I know you have some things in the work. So what, what, what are your plans for the next few years for Back of the Bus? What are the plans for Back of the Bus? Next few years? Uh, preferably not die. Um, so the short answer is I don't actually know because who the hell knows what's happening with um, everything. But... I can say like immediate future stuff, I guess. Like what, how I'm thinking about like how we adjust to a time of COVID. Because I mean, I think that my own feeling about um, the time post COVID has been that I have not been particularly satisfied by a lot of the, a lot of the options of how people have adjusted. So like, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like the Zoom show or the digital drag show. Like I've definitely participated in some. They're not my favorite way of making performance. They're not my favorite way of watching drag performance. Um, I find some of it to be quite uh, depressing because it only makes me like miss performing more than anything else. So, I mean, I, you know, like that in a way that's the backdrop to what I'm saying, I guess. My most immediate thing is that I'm about to, or actually, when is this thing going up? Friday. So literally Chinese yeah. New Year. So I guess by the time this video goes up, like I would have um, at least launched my YouTube channel. Oh, wow. You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here... Second. Oh, I don't know that you would hear it here first. You'd probably hear it from, <laughs> from something else <laughs> before this, like, you know, my own Facebook. But um, I would have launched my own YouTube channel. Be very real, I've been very resistant to, try to getting on YouTube because I think there are a lot of ways in which... There are a lot of things about social media and and something like YouTube that you can't control, right? Like, like You can't control how you're being received, for instance. And unlike live performance, you, you can't adjust in real time to uh, how you're being received. But um, my sense is I'm just going to get over that and, uh, see, and see what happens, shall we just say that. I have some thoughts about what's going to be on that channel and I'm not and I also have some openness to like what it can be which is exciting mm -hmm. so um, any 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 clues I think that people are interested in like the nonsense that I wear guess especially given that I make all of it or almost all of it so there's going to be a big element of that of like um instructional video to make things that are completely useless and i you know and a lot of that would lean into like my aesthetics so uh i do know that uh people seem to be very interested in the fact that i don't really wear wigs um 
which I suppose if you're following um, Drag Race right now is Joey uh, J. Maybe a way to get voted. <laughs> maybe a way to get sent off the show. But I, um, well, didn't you find it quite? But I am not on Drag Race. Did you find it quite interesting that he was sent off by 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 a queen that wasn't wearing a wig? Yeah, I I get that, and you know, in a lot of ways, like that style of being a bald drag queen of like I'm just gonna like randomly throw something on my head and. Call yeah. it a day is like <laughs> it's totally my yeah, vibe. Yeah, La, La, La um, thing did remind me of of, of you. <laughs> it, it's interesting you say that because actually you're not the first person to, say, to literally say that to me. And part of what it is, I think, is that like during the sort of beginning stages of COVID, um, I participated in a in a digital drag show out of I want to say Brooklyn. Uh-huh. And uh, the look that was in my number was essentially that, like essentially those exactly those colors and that texture. It wasn't a, it wasn't a bag. It was it was a stuffed uh, unicorn. Um, but you know, it's like it's that it's that, it's that sort of like pinky, purpley, super girly colors, right? Yeah, cool. I, I say I think, and I, I I know that at the beginning there's going to be videos that are about. Um, I think I'm going to call it uh, not a wig, but a series of things about that is just about making things for your head that are not wigs. And I particularly enjoy that this has like absolute, almost no practical uh, use in real life, right? Like there's, there, there, there's almost no reason that somebody would make random shit to stick on their head. Like it doesn't actually serve a purpose. Mm-hmm. It's, it's purely about like the frivolity of of what we do and I and I think there's something quite powerful in insisting that that's that's relevant. What else? What else? There's going to be stuff about making costumey things. Uh, ultimately, I, I will also be creating a series of what I hope will be a long-term series of videos that um, that sort of blend elements of commentary and entertainment and performance and lip sync and music and and object performance. I'm imagining them to be nothing more than 10 minutes, but um, in these sort of like extended video pieces. That sounds a lot more artistic than I would that I would otherwise be comfortable uh, saying. <laughs> You're mentioning some like video essays or something. Like yeah, that. I mean, I think that's the... I think video essays are probably like the best word to describe it, but I also am very reluctant to say that there will be video essays because I feel like there are people on YouTube who excel at this form of video oh, essays, yeah. right? Like people like ContraPoints, for instance, uh-huh. it's, it's probably like, I, I don't want to say the ultimate, but I think she's the one that comes to mind the most when we talk about video essays. First of all, I'm not that smart. I'm smart, but not that smart. Um, she's amazing. Uh, but Matthew also Wynn. extraordinarily intelligent, extraordinarily researched, actually a very compelling performer. So yeah, you know, like I, 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 I hesitate to use words like video essay because I you know I think people like her have have very have very much defined the form on YouTube in a in in a way and have have defined what excellence can look like and um I would rather not set myself up for the comparison, put it that way. How about makeup? Do you do you do you foresee yourself doing like makeup stuff? Do I think I'm gonna be making makeup videos? <laughs> yeah. Mm, I think it's possible. I say this as I can't find my sharpener. Um <laughs> I think it's entirely possible, but um, but again, I guess I, I should say I just don't know, you mm. know, because um, I know I know you're quite passionate about makeup too, right? We we've had several um, discussions about YouTube makeup and all sorts of stuff like that. Like I enjoy wearing makeup. I enjoy making new shapes on my face. I've always been very curious about like, and I mean it's funny saying this to you because obviously that's what you do, but. Like, I've always been very curious about, like, the impulse to make videos showing people, like, makeup looks. Um, especially in the context of drag, because it's like, how do you say this? Like, for most people, it's not it's not actually instructional, right? It's like, it's just kind of like, you watch it because you feel like watching it. And that's perfectly valid. But I also don't think I'm that good at it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's why, I mean, the... the, right. the um, direction I took my channel in. I know it's not instructional, but you know, I talk about something else and I bring, oh, my camera can't find my face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and I think I think that that's part of, part of what you do in that space is very interesting, especially the stuff that you do about dermatology, I find very interesting. Oh good, yay. Certainly interesting, but more than that, I find, I, I, I enjoy the kind of, the way those ideas are connected, like the idea of skin and the idea of makeup. Not a big conceptual leap, <laughs> um, but, a con- but, but, a, but a connection that is, that I think is compelling. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. How about like reaction stuff? Would you do that? I know you, you, re- you, you at one point did a um, uh, reaction to the National Day Parade or something, and that went over really, really well. Is that something that you would do more of? 
You know the thing. The thing that I, I guess, the thing I struggle with the most is, I think that what I, what it comes down to for me is, I am not dying to put out content that is that just doesn't add to the culture. Uh -huh. My thinking around around like reaction content is that like, I don't really want to do reaction content if like this. It's not something that like I can you that I that for whatever reason my reaction to it is. Um, somehow useful, important, or particularly entertaining. But I mean like, I, I mean like reaction you know. content to like maybe local stuff like Singaporean um, politics or something. I don't know, YouTubers. something like that. <laughs> Sometimes I also think like, is my take on politics that hot? It's, it's kind of what I'm, it's kind of where I'm at, you know? There are people who have like really hot, interesting, complex uh, takes that are not necessarily predictable. And um, and I respect them a lot. Like you've had some of them here, so you know, people like Ashley Fifty. I think has very interesting things to say. Yeah, Ashley Fifty, love their podcast. No shade on anybody because everybody should do what they want to do. But like, do I want to make like reaction videos to like say Drag Race because like obviously there's a you know that's it's in a way it's relatable content. Yeah. I, and you know obviously as a drag queen you have a take on it that is like that is specific right uh -huh. but do i want to sit around and like talk about uh talk about a tv show that is in my mind defining drag in a way that i don't necessarily think is particularly helpful i i, I don't know that i want to add to that you know what i mean like i don't know that i i i want to give it more relevance in, than than it already has that's not to say i don't enjoy drag race i enjoy it a lot i do but i do think that as a cultural product I think we all agree that 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 elements of it are deeply problematic. Um, um, use, maybe that could be your word. take, right? You could you could have a video talking about how this does not represent. I mean, the entire video is going to be me going like, uh, actually, uh, drag show is not. Yeah, what I want. no, I, I think people people will want to see that, don't you think? <laughs> that this is not like repeat ad nauseum. <laughs> not really. <laughs> like the hot take is actually drag show is not a damn one. You, you you know what I mean? Like. There is a limit to how much that you're going to need to say that, yeah. right? And certainly there's nuance and certainly there's a lot of things to unpack about Drag Race. But actually, there are people who do it a lot better, including people who've actually been on the bloody show and and have insight that, like, I would never have. So for me, that's, that's the sort of... Uh, the, the, the sort of broader question with the entire project is, like, what is wh what is the overlap of like my aesthetics and my and my sensitive and my sensibilities, um, and my interests with with the medium that is video that is video and that is uh, that is accessible video, if you will. Mm. What is possible and what are the potentials of overlapping these two things? Um, and and for me, that's that's the approach I want to take with it. So I know that like there's something quite fun about watching me, like people enjoy watching people make things. And in a sense, I know that like I make things that people are interested in. Um, and so for me, that seems like something that I want to get involved with. I know that I have things to say about the about the broader world, and there's something and video offers something that it, that like live entertainment doesn't, and so I'm interested in that. I also know that I have interesting that I know a bunch of interesting people. So another thread down the line might be um, a series of conversations, which maybe exists more as a podcast like than this. as YouTube. I don't know, <laughs> but um, yeah, like maybe like this, but maybe also uh, a bit more just focused on the exchange of ideas, you know? Mm. So a podcast is in the works too? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily the form. I don't know if it's a podcast or if it's a podcast with video or, you know, it's an extent, it's, a, it's an extended series of exquisite corpse uh, writings. Who knows? That's all, in my book, that's all possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the opportunities, I think, and the ideas are endless, right? Now, now, now that digital entertainment has opened up so much, I think you should just really try to explore as many things as you can. Yeah, um, I agree. I'm very conscious of adding to the to the, to the dung heap of history, if you will. As you say, you're not getting any younger. You might as well put out more 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 of your art out there as much as possible. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, but also like, what do you want to be remembered by? You know what I mean? Like, again, no shade on anybody, but like, there are people who are going to be remembered by things that like really like it's not what they're about. Also, I'm putting eyeshadow under my eye right now, and like talking's gonna be hard. Haha. <laughs> There comes a point in my makeup where my camera can't find my face and oh. it won't focus. <laughs> um, this used to be like the story of my life. Remember how there was a time where 
um, in the time of MySpace, there were all these websites that did these like uh, where they would morph your face with a celebrity or like oh, yeah, what celebrity yeah, yeah. do you look like. And every time I would play with those things, they would say like, cannot detect face. You know, I, th I think my makeup's quite generic because on Facebook, I get all these alerts all the time um, from any drag oh, yeah. queen that is being uploaded. Um, I, I get, get RuPaul a lot. Is this you? Yeah, me too. I get, <laughs> I get RuPaul a lot. And, and I, there's I, the part of me like, that oh, wants to be... Is my makeup that good? <laughs> it's like, there's a part of me that wants to be flattered and then there's a part of me that just thinks like my eyebrow is that far from my eye. Uh, there's some questions I want to ask you. It might be a bit um, sensitive, mm -hmm. but what are your finances like in drag? Let's say pre-COVID as a drag queen in Singapore? Oh, I mean, actually, I say this a lot to, like, younger performers who talk about wanting to go full-time. I really went full-time as a performer in 2015, and in 2015... 2015 was a very interesting time to be in drag because... or to start of or to be performing at all, because in 2015 was SG50, mm. um, oh, yeah. which meant that there were a lot of opportunities out there because there was just a lot of money floating around. Uh, to do cultural projects, right? Um, so twenty fifteen was a very was a very like good year for somebody to start out. Twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen were very tough though, uh, because all that money dried up. Twenty nineteen was the first time I didn't feel like I was on the brink of like financial disaster. That's the reality. It took four years of working at the level that I was working at, which is like actually quite. A lot. You know, I wouldn't say you can't make money in drag because obviously I have, but it takes a while to build yourself to sort of create enough work for yourself to do that now. Do you do you do you ever see yourself branching out to other things like theater, act I mean I know you've done some of that stuff, right? But you know, actual theater, makeup makeup artists or something something yeah, else. Yeah, I mean I haven't so for me, like I know that there are performers that do that. I'm not super talented in painting in painting first of all. I'm not super talented in painting my own face, which is uh, which begs the question why the fuck we're having this conversation. But I'm even less talented at painting somebody else's face. Actually, like it's a skill that I don't have. You know, I I am not that good at being gentle on somebody's skin. You know, like all these things that make you hireable as a makeup artist are not things that I'm particularly good at. The ways that I have sort of mm -hmm. diversified have had to do with things like creating merch and creating lines of like so like for instance, uh you know, I used to have a li I still do have a line of T-shirts called Bus Detour, which was a way of creating uh, merchandise T-shirts that wasn't about printing T-shirts. So I was made. I was sort of embellishing mm -hmm. T-shirts with appliques of all the all the leftover material from making my own costume, so people could literally walk around with. Oh yeah. Like and you and you're doing it in masks now, with, right? Like pieces of me, and then now you know because masks are you know as they say the necessary accessory yeah i'm doing that i'm doing the same i'm doing a similar thing with masks now where i make masks and i sell them and i hand make everything uh i started off working only with materials that uh would otherwise have become costumes but then i, I think in the copy i say you know the materials were in, intended to become her costumes but, but then covid and i think that's still true for some of the materials i use but like i feel like i'm now making enough masks that like that's not actually sustainable anymore so now i'm i'm buying materials and yeah that's what i do right the brand the brand is called cover your pie hole um you can buy them online we're available link down below <laughs> link down below <laughs> cover your pie hole dot shop um but also link in description yeah. link in the description are we supposed to do this mm. <laughs> yeah link in description this is why I'm bad at Use code use code Wondersnatch for 10% off. Uh, no, no code. code. There's no code. <laughs> Sorry, bitch. Like uh we are in the we're in times of COVID. Just give me the fucking money. But also available in, in, in retail, right? So I'm at we're at Design Orchard and we're also at uh Super Freak, which is Bobby's shop. You know, it it, it for me it's a it's like, well, if we have to if we have to wear a mask, we might as well do something that's quite fun with it, right? And where do you see back at the bus in 10 years? I know you've mentioned, we've talked about this just now, about how your face falls when you don't when you're when you're not able to do drag anymore, what do you think you'd be doing? I don't know. I mean, I suspect the performance stuff will will naturally evolve into something else. I don't know what. You know, in in a way, that's also my interest in like making video is sort of understanding like other things that I could be doing or other modes of mm -hmm. making. And I, I and I and I presume you still be producing shows. You could do riot, but you know, just produce it. Is that is that? Do you think that's viable? Um. If it's still relevant to do. Okay, mm. so this is gonna sound like very privileged, and it is, but I just don't feel like I can sustain for myself doing things in which I don't feel like they are I don't feel like they're relevant, if that makes sense. So mm. for me that's the first cut. Is it is it relevant? Because if it's not, then it's just not 
sustainable on a kind of like personal level. So maybe um, this digital stuff is really the way to go for you. I don't know that it's the way to go, but I think it's part of, I think it's one of the steps in trying to understand what, you know, in, in discovering what else is possible. I mean, I'm under no illusions that like, I'm going to start a YouTube vid, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and, and the first things I throw at that channel are the things that stick, like, let's get real, that doesn't happen for anybody. Yeah, of course, obviously. <laughs> yeah, YouTube is a, quite a bitch to um, figure out. Yeah, exactly. All right, so I think we're almost done. Um, why don't we just uh, cut it there and we'll be back with a finished look? Yeah, I mean, I okay. can't wait to see what's going to happen. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll see you in a bit. Bye. And we're back. These are Chinese New Year looks. I'm a Ming vase for these pussy willows. Yeah, I even painted these pussy willows blue. <laughs> mm. Your pussy is blue. And what are you, Becca? Uh, <laughs> I think like a lot of like gold and flower, flower and pink and orange. Actually, my eyes are two oranges. They're like kumquats on my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all I've ever wanted for somebody to like rest their kumquats on my eyes. <laughs> Alright, another way of teabagging. <laughs> uh, yeah, but just on the eyes. It's very comforting. It removes our Chinese eye bags. Chinese teabagging. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Becca, why do you tell everyone where they can find you on the internet? Um, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Becca the Bus. That's B E C C A D B U S. Uh, and on YouTube, the link would be below. Yes, all linked down below. So follow Becca the Bus on Instagram, Facebook, and she's got a YouTube channel coming up. So everyone keep tuned for that. I'll link it down in the below when it's live too. All right, so if you like this video, don't forget to give me a big thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and ring that bell for post notifications so you know it every time I upload a new video. All right, Becca, I hope you had a good time today and happy Chinese New Year. Happy Chinese New Year. Thanks for having me. Gong si fa tai. Something, something, eight people in the house. <laughs> All right, bye, Becca. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, and then and then I do some posing montage. <laughs> Find China for Chinese New Year. In my armpits. <laughs> Girl, you're so hot like summer, and I don't wonder what the love of. Like my boot window. No one can do it like you. Girl, you're so hot like summer. You're everything I ever wanted. You give me feels that you do. No one can do it like you. Interviews. I interviewed Mona Kiki there while we did a Trixie and Katya makeup, and Vandom is Joachim there while we got into Christmas looks.